Hi, this is Greg Rico, original drummer for Sly and the Family Stone, and it's my pleasure to be here with you all on the Extraordinary Drummer Show. Well, welcome back. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Drummer Show. As you know, I'm your host, Sharon Moore. You know, I always say today, today, today. <laughs> well, it's just that, y'all. I got the man on the show today. Oh, man, you couldn't have told me when I was trying to cop all those licks. I'll be talking. <laughs> Face to face, <laughs> he just you never know what life has to bring. My That's guest right. today, he's a musician, he's a producer, he's a producer, he's actually a legend. You remember him from such songs as <laughs> Sing a Simple Song, Dance to the Music, You Can Make It If You Try, Thank You, and so many more. Uh, from the hit group, from the legendary group, Sly and the Family Stone. He's a drummer's drummer. Please help me welcome Greg Arico. Hey, Greg. Hey, what's up, Sharon? <laughs> How you like that big intro? <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> Smile on my face. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Hey, no. Welcome to the Extraordinary Drummer Show. Good to be here. You Now, I can see the bridge behind you, so it answers my first question. You're originally from San Francisco, huh? Born and raised. Yep. Yes, uh, that Bay Area, man. A lot of pocket yeah. up there, boy. <laughs> you know, you know uh, what is I mean, I, I'm fortunate because right place, right time. I mean, uh, I came, I was born in 48. So when I was in my late teens, early 20s, that was the mid 60s. You know, we started the group, Flying to Family Stone, in December of 1966. I was 17 and a half and San Francisco just exploded during that period. I mean, all the music that came out of there and the artists and it's just, it was a, what a wonderful time and all the songs written during that period. I call it the musical renaissance of the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah, that's man. What, You know, and, and history has proven that. You started playing drums when you was 14. I started when I was 14. So I got my first drum set. Started when I was 14. And then, uh, yeah. What did that song, Take Five, do to your playing? Did that song, Take Five, kind of sort of set you up as a drummer? Well, I used to listen to stuff like that. So that's in five, right? But I, I so I would listen to stuff like, you know, this was Brubeck. That was a song, I was in five. Um, then I, you know, I'd listen to Aretha. I listened to Ray Charles. I listened to, you know, uh, Wilson Pickett. I remember Doug Camp, JB, of course. And so I used to play the little forty-five RPM singles, and I had this little room, and I had my brother who was six years older than me, so he had a, a forty-five RPM record changer. He had pretty good taste in music, so you know. And San Francisco was. The international inter intersection. I mean, it was a very culturally deep city. So you had all these music here that you could listen to, you know. And Let me uh, move you over to speaking of Sly and the Family Stone. You joined that band, as you said, when you were 17. That was just out of high school, wasn't it? I, I had a half year left in high school. We started the band December of 66. I was 17 and a half. What was it like meeting meeting Freddie, Sly's brother? Well, Freddie and I met a year before through a, a guy named Leon Petilla, who later on, he had a band called um, Leon's Creation. And Le, uh, Leon later on became lead singer. He played was lead singer in Santana for quite a while, several years back in the 80s or something like that. But back then he had this band and I was going out one Friday night, 16, just got my license, had my car, and I had my hand at the door, just about to go out the door, and the phone rang. I grabbed it, and it's Leon. He goes, Le he goes Greg, Greg, man, you got to help me out. My drummer's sick tonight, and I'm playing at the Y on Mission Street, San Francisco. You come down. So I go, okay. I threw my drums in the car, and I went down there. So it happens to be that he had this guy sitting in on a guitar that night, and his name is Freddie Stewart. We started talking, and we hit it off, and, you know, then I found out, well, that's Sly Stone's brother, so I knew Sly Stone because 
he was a DJ back then. He didn't in any group or anything like that. He was a DJ. And he had a great radio show. There were two stations. First was KSOL here in the Bay Area in Oakland. And then KDIA went to KDIA. And he just had the hippest show. So Freddie and I started a group called Freddie and the Stone Souls. And we played around the Bay Area about a year. And then Sly, during that period, beside his radio show, he had made a couple of attempts putting musical group together that wasn't working so he had assembled he had like this he was going to do it one more time he had met different people and had a list and so he had him and freddie had arranged and they didn't tell me he had arranged one night i'm showing up for rehearsal for the stone souls and and i show up and none of the guys are there and and i, I see you know freddie and 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 and, and so we're in the kitchen eating. I go in there and say, we're all, said, we're all the guys. He goes, well, we're starting a new group tonight. And so they didn't tell me, but that nice slide and Freddie had arranged to have everybody, Larry, uh, Jerry, uh, Cynthia, there to meet. And we're going to put a group together. So we all met that night. We didn't even play. We just talked. And we were just blown away by just kind of looking at each other, talking and just the concept of putting a musical group together with all this, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't like the fault setting of the day, putting a group together with male and female and black and white. It wasn't happening then. It's mid sixties. So it was kind of exciting to us. We thought this is a great idea. You know, we started rehearsing the next night. We rehearsed for a week straight. And um, Sly had already met this guy, Rich Romanello who owned a club called the Winchester Cathedral in Redwood City. And he was gonna he was gonna handle the group. So he had arranged for us to start playing that following week and we started gigging. You know, and we did no originals yet. We just did covers. But but we had discussed this that night that when we do this, you know, this is what we're gonna have to do before we do any original stuff. But we're gonna take these top ten tunes, whatever, these cover tunes, and make them our own each one we'll take them and just we'll take that material and we'll own it just change wow. it up and the way we want to do it and that's when we start that's how it started wow let me chime in there i'm going to mention a couple of names of songs briefly tell me what do, what do they mean to you uh thank you <clears throat> that's, that was funky by the way i gotta tell you craig you laid on that one <laughs> Uh, okay, so thank you. There's probably a half a dozen or more versions of that as we first, you know, took it on, start developing it. And one has nothing to do with the other. If you was to hear him, you go, that's got nothing to do with where it ended up. But I remember when we finally when we got a track that Sly felt comfortable about, he came and uh, he goes, I'm going to disappear for about two weeks and take this and I'm going to go in the studio and through what I'm hearing, you know, sure enough, that's what he did. And he developed, you know, those those three parts on two guitar parts and bass part that make up the the fundamental melodic rhythm part of that song, which is just no one had done anything like that up until that point. On all the singles that we cut, not the album cuts, but the singles, I would go before mixing them, I would go back in the studio and just focus in on the intro, the verses, the choruses, and just just own it. Lay down rhythms, you know, and and then we'd mix. And uh, that's how we did the singles. And that song was, I remember, I remember cutting it. I remember that <laughs> overdubbing, redoing the drum part so we could mix it. Yeah. Greg, how did you, how did you cop or mesh yourself to Larry Graham style of playing with the plucking <laughs> and everything? Well, did you see, uh, there's a stick people, stick yeah, people. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. That Larry and I did, and he addresses that specifically. 
your question. And yeah, we just had a great chemistry. We never talked a lot or, you know, discussed it. it we had a chemistry. We realized that right from the top and we just left it alone, you know, and we just showed up every moment and each moment and we give and take and it just worked. Did a lot of people think you were black back in those days? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I knew there was a lot of racial tensions in those years. Yeah. But right in the middle of all that racial tension, you guys do a song, Don't Call Me Nigger Whitey. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when Sly first, uh, when we were in the studio, and, you know, a lot of times the song started out with just the title, a name, a concept. And I remember when he first ran it down to me, he goes, and he ran the name down. And I, and I look at him, I go, dude, you sure you want to do that? And he goes, oh, now we're doing this. <laughs> and, I, you know, I knew if he took something on, he had just the kind of personality that this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring it home, you know. Greg, let's talk endorsements. What are you doing, drum gear, cymbals, sticks, heads, drums, so forth? Craig, we do a thing on the show we call Word of Advice, where I ask the drummers if they'll leave a parting word of advice for the up-and-coming drummers, even the guys at the next level, but that are trying to get traction in this game, in this industry. Would you mm -hmm. leave them a word of advice? You know, uh, yeah, you know, do what you're doing with passion and focus and deep intent. And uh, and if you're not enjoying it no more, stop doing it. What was it like being inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? And then we got word that there was this Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had um, put us on the, the list to vote for people to vote for, you know, groups that sh should be inducted. And we were inducted and that just flipped the light on again. You know, I know and, we, uh, press for time a little bit. Just yeah. give me a couple of, couple of seconds on what was it like playing Woodstock? Oh, Woodstock was wonderful. Woodstock was a wonderful kind thing. It was a wonderful kind of experience. It was a really magical thing. Uh, you know, there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of outdoor festivals during that time period. Matter of fact, Woodstock came at the latter end of all these festivals that were happening and a lot of groups didn't want to play them no more because it was difficult, you know, it'd either be muddy or it'd be too hot and there's no coverage, you know, the stage production isn't like it is today. Sound systems were funky. If it was daytime, you get battered by the sun. It was no covered, and then it rain on you. Then you get electrocuted from the mics. I mean, it was a mess. Be all muddy and this and that. So a lot of groups kind of passed. We did it first, and our manager came and says, "No, you guys got to do this." Matter of fact, we're going to film it too, and uh, it's turning into. It was kind of what one of those things that initially was started as a. It was just supposed to be a music and arts fair with the Grateful Dead. And then it kind of just kept blowing up and where Michael was going to have the event kept being challenged because that county didn't want all these hippies coming up there and all these people there. And, you know, I mean, they didn't know what to do with this. So it went through all this morphine and, and just by spiritual means, it ends up this guy, Max Yeager, gave his farm for it to have. And now they got a place and it... And it it all came together like that, really kind of haphazard, and and then grew into a thing where just everybody wanted to be there. And you know, I remember the week coming up to it. Uh, it was three or four days before the event. You know, the highway story was on the news. The highways were getting clogged up, and people were parking and walking the rest of the way to this rock and roll uh event that's happening out in the country of in, in upper state upstate new york 
And it was really kind of an interesting thing. I mean, finally, when we actually got to the hotel, and I remember uh, we had this, it was a two-story Holiday Inn, and we all the groups had this top floor, and, you know, Hendrix was there, Janis Joplin, we were there, and all the doors opened, and it's like one big party. And then we were told there were really challenges on actually getting to the site because the roads were mudded out they were clogged up with cars you couldn't get by and we had to take the helicopter in and i remember just going in and uh, just arriving when we got closer and closer to the scene and you, you seen i didn't know what it was and it, it was a sea of people coming in from a helicopter uh, seeing a half a million people I'd never seen this before I mean, it was it's kind of like a new thing, you know. I mean, it was very unusual. This cloud of smoke kind of hanging over the top of it, <laughs> you know, and just the whole thing was was really special, different, and magical. Greg, what do you think of today's drumming? Where the the way the guys are playing these days? It's fabulous drummers. I mean, back when I was coming up, you know, there were no videos and social media where you could see you know all the stuff that was going on there was no uh instructional videos and all that and, you know so it wasn't i i was my first influence was buddy rich you know it was big band jazz and uh today it's just amazing of every age every color every ethnic background just unbelievable drummers you know and 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 you know in the interim between that period where i came up and and now then you have the whole electronic thing where you know synthesizers drum synthesizers groups and producers start using machines instead of real drummers and of course that came back around to where that has its place but so does a real drummer laying it down you know and it's really just many phenomenal you know, drummers, these, you know, this is, and, and rhythm, and, you know, I remember, I, I, I was kind of, I remember Sly had a really, this wonderful, free, open concept to rhythm. He was, he was a drummer himself, in, by heart, you know, but uh, he didn't really play. I mean, he played, but, you know, he wasn't a drummer drummer, right? But he felt it, and he, so, it, it, that gave me carte blanche to do anything that came to me and him i mean he had wonderful ideas quite often also i mean once in a while we would kind of we kind of now nah, man this is what it should be now nah, nah, it should be this and we you know but we would always work it out and it was just a total joy working with them back in those days <laughs> Greg, let me ask you this last question. Yeah. Greg, what do you want your legacy to be, to be said, to be told? Well, I, you know, I guess it, I wouldn't change it. I don't think it just kind of speaks for itself in all the things I did. You know, I, I like different kinds of music. I, I was fortunate enough to be, exposed to and even have the opportunities to play different kinds of music you know later on up to leaving sly went out on a world tour with the weather report joe zavano went shorter and you know um i just did stuff with santana who we all came up together with i met him before the group and carlos was in high school matter of fact i just went and sat in with him Two months ago down in Vegas at the House of Blues, his residency down there. And now he's got a, a wonderful drummer that he ended up marrying, and Cindy Bachman. She's a great drummer. Uh, you know, so, I, you know, my legacy, you know, I got into production. I got into writing. Lee Oscar, we had I produced all his records. We wrote something called San Francisco Bay back in the mid-70s that ended up 
being derivative derivative of many songs the last the biggest one being uh pitbull and keisha did a song called timber that was from san francisco bay and we ended up getting a piece of that song and it was huge and they you know ends up being 11 writers on it with all putting their two cents into it too and their ideas and it was, it was a big record so i mean uh i like everything that i did and uh, I like diversity, and I've, I've had the opportunity to get involved on on that level, and it's been wonderful, you know. And hopefully, I mean, I got some new ideas of things I want to do now. I'm getting ready to move down to Las Vegas, and a uh, good place to get into it because that's, without a doubt, the musical intersection of the world right now. Musical in entertainment intersection, everything that exist anywhere in the world comes through there yeah way cool greg let me say thank you so very much for being on the extraordinary drummer show man okay my pleasure i'm glad uh i'm glad dennis uh gave you my number and we were able to meet and i'm able to do it yeah man will you help us wave goodbye to all the fans sorry will you help us wave goodbye to all the fans Absolutely. Good to see y'all. Bye.